Hi, welcome to All Things Billy. Before we get started, please hit the subscribe button right down in the corner. And you'll be notified each time a new show is posted. Now, on to All Things Billy. Welcome to All Things Billy. It's me, Michael Anthony Judicici. Thank you for joining me for today's episode. No guests today, just me and you. <laughs> today we're going to talk about February 18th, a, uh, a dark day in the history of the Lincoln County War, <clears throat> or the start of it, uh, but not just February 18th, 1878 but February 18th, 2022, because those two dates are inexorably linked uh, by uh, a new project that I have uh, coming out. And we're going to just talk a little about that, but mostly about February 18th, 1878. Um, if you'd like to get involved, <laughs> involved in the show, it's pretty easy. Send an email, billythekidridesagain at gmail.com. Or just go on Twitter, BTK Rides, R I D E S. And that's all you need to do. Send me a message, complaint, kudos, attaboy, whatever. And uh, I get lots of uh, feedback on the YouTube channel where I also post the episodes with one image that you can st <laughs> stare at for an hour while you're listening. So if you don't like to listen, <laughs> and you want something to look at and you don't mind looking at the same picture, head over to my channel, Michael Anthony Judicissi. Just search for that, and uh, and you'll find my YouTube channel. Uh, but lots of people comment there, so I appreciate uh, all of you. Thank you. All right. So uh, what we're talking about February 18th, if you don't know, is essentially the day that the first shots were fired in the Lincoln County War. Those shots, regrettably, wound up in the body of John Henry Tunstall, who was a merchant and cattle rancher uh, and employer of Billy the Kid. I'm sure most of you know that. Um, the, the, you can, if you listen to Drew Gomber's episode uh, from a couple of weeks back, you'll see that Gomber really feels McSween was the bad guy in all of this. And um, I, I can't even dispute that. I don't think any of them were all good nor do I think any of them were all bad, but certainly Alexander McSween's actions with this $10,000 life insurance policy from the estate of Emil Fritz uh, caused a bunch of things in succession to happen that ended with John Tunstall being killed. And I, I'd like to, you know, I want to get to the point of you know, when, when Tunstall's party is overtaken and uh, three men ride Tunstall off the trail, and then something happens, and all we have is the testimony of the men that were there. We don't have Tunstall's because he was dead, and we don't have any of his regulators because they scattered up into the hills to kind of take some defensive positions, and Tunstall refused, not refused, I guess couldn't or didn't, um, didn't follow them. But you wonder at any point, I just made a film, 30 Seconds in Hell, about the gunfight at the OK Corral. And it struck me that at any point during that day before the Earps fought the Clantons, if one person had made one different decision, I mean, one minor thing, it starts a cascade of actions that changes the entire outcome of the day. And, you know, if Virgil Earp, in that case, says, you know what, they're threatening us, they're drunk, uh, I've got the law on my side. I'm not going to go down and confront them. I'm going to let everybody cool off, and then I'm going to get some reinforcements in here and ride them out for good. Uh, then Billy uh, Clanton, uh, uh, Tom and Frank McClowry are not dead. And and all of the uh, Earps and Holiday, except for Wyatt, are not wounded. And Morgan doesn't lose his life a couple weeks later. Like It just took one small decision. And that's kind of the way it was on the day that Tunstall was killed. Any tiny, small decision, or, or even moderate-sized decision, could have changed the outcome of his life, which would have changed the outcome or even the start of the Lincoln County War, and would have changed New Mexico history forever. 
So it's worth talking about and, uh, you know, getting a good understanding uh, of what happened and what the, you know, what the outcomes were. Uh, there's a court case. And what we see is that uh, Dolan, uh, Murphy and Dolan are looking to get a writ of attachment against Alexander McSween's property. A writ of attachment just means you can hold that much property, take possession of it uh, in uh, whatever the value amount on the writ is. And so the value amount on this writ is $10,000 because that's how much McSween is holding or even spending, uh, according to Drew, uh, from the insurance policy. He doesn't let it go. He wants to hold on to it. Maybe he wants it for greed. Maybe he wants it because he wants to make sure he legally should hand it over. But no matter what, uh, it, th there's things that he could have done rather than hold the money. Dolan gets the writ of attachment. And on February 8th, he arrives in Lincoln and takes it to Brady and says, hey, here, here you go. Do your job, <laughs> Sheriff. You're in... Uh, you know, you're, you're in our pocket anyway. And so uh, go do your job, attach McSween's property. So they go to McSween's house. I mean, they enter his house with legal authority and they attach his property. I don't know if McSween had stuff worth 10 grand. That was quite a bit of money back then. Um, and I don't think they valued his law books or those kind of things very much. So then they just go to the Tunstall store. They assume that McSween and Tunstall are in business together. And to my memory, there was some there was some sort of business arrangement, but I don't, it was not partnership in the store, but they just assume that the guys are partners. And so half of what's in the store now belongs to McSween and they can attach that. $10,000 is the key amount. Brady goes way overboard. And reports are that by the time he's done inventorying the Tunstall store and occupying it like an army, uh, he's got merchandise worth $40,000. Well, that's a problem. If you want to engender some bad feelings with your enemies and you have the law on your side, then just disregard the legal status of what you're charged to do and go do whatever the hell you want, which is essentially what Brady did. He had the advantage and he pressed it. They, they occupied Tunstall's store. They threw him out. He couldn't get in there. He couldn't do business. He couldn't sell anything. All of his inventory was locked up. And there certainly was no, um, you know, there's a spring term of the district court coming, <clears throat> but there was no guarantee that this was going to be cleared up. I mean, this is February. Spring is what, April? You're going to le let your store wither on the vine for two months? So... Understandably, Tunstall is infuriated, and he and Fred Waite and Bonnie and I think uh, John Middleton or uh, Wiedemann, they, they go and confront Brady, and Brady tells him to get the hell out of here. So that's, uh, that's a big problem for Tunstall and for McSween, but it gets even worse. On February 11th, uh, the uh, uh, let me get the day right there. Um, yeah, I believe it's February 11th. <clears throat> Brady decides, you know what? It's not just the merchandise in Tunstall's store, but now I'm going to attach all the cattle he has on the Rio Feliz down at his ranch. Wait, what? You've got 40 grand worth of stuff against a $10,000 writ of attachment, and now you're going to go get all the cattle? I think cattle were worth about 25 bucks a head back then. Horse was about $100. At least that's you know generally the value ascribed. So if Tunstall had 200 head of cattle, that's, uh, who's smart enough to do this? Not me. That's four per hundred. And so he's got 200. So uh, he's 25, $5,000 worth of cattle. I think that's about right. So now you got 40 grand worth of property, plus you got the stuff you, you attached from McSween's house, and now you got another $5,000 worth of cattle. I'd be pissed. I'd be pissed. 
and the things uh, continue to deteriorate. You've got a an Englishman who came, I won't say with the best of intentions, because Tunstall came with the same intentions that Murphy and Dolan had, but he had a facade of good intentions. You know, looked cheerful and genial. Chip, chip, cheerio. Had McSween, who I think people generally regarded as lawful. And now his his business, his entire business, his livelihood, his ability to, you know, to survive has been stolen from him and held against its will. I think all of us at that point, you know, yes, you might seek remedy in the courts, but it's not like you can march down to, uh, you know, district court <clears throat> and file a suit here. I mean, that this was, you know, traveling uh, court and the spring term was when the judge would be in town. What are you going to do until then? Ride three days to Santa Fe to try to get a judge there to hear the case? go to Messia, you know, out of the jurisdiction. I mean, you just don't have a lot of options. So you can sit there and take it or as often happened on the, uh, out on the range or on the prairie, you can take matters into your own hands. And that's kind of the point that John Henry Tunstall was at in middle February, 1878. <laughs> So on February 13th, the uh, Matthews posse makes its way to the Rio Feliz. They demand, they show the writ, they demand all the cattle that belong to McSween. Widman says, take them all that belong to McSween, except none of them. They all belong to Tunstall. There's some confusion ensuing, and they both decide we need some new instructions here. Um you know, the, there's posturing on both sides, but ultimately, uh, they all, both sides, or at least representative from both sides, decide to ride back to Lincoln. Uh, the uh, the uh, Dolan men to meet with Brady and figure out the next move and tell him, hey, McSween doesn't have any cattle there. At least that's what we're told. And then uh, Widman ride, rides back uh, along with Billy Bonney to uh, talk to Tunstall and figure out what he wants to do next. Tunstall sees this thing is spinning out of control. I think it's, uh, you, you got to remember when he died, he's 24 years old. 24 years old. Think about, you know, where you were at 24 years old, running a, a ranch and a retail store uh, and you know, having people that were out to kill you <laughs> because you were doing so. I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty heady stuff for a 24 year old. So, you know, by the evening of the 16th, Tunstall is, you know, still trying to get men to ride with him, but Brady is able to recruit a posse uh, with guys from seven rivers and he's got over 40 men. And there's just, there's no way that Tunstall is going to raise that many men to fight against Dolan, Brady, and Murphy's forces in one day. Just not going to happen. And so he starts to reconsider and he goes, okay, I'm going to have to let the courts handle this. I've got to do that because otherwise, you know, they're going to take everything or all, all my men will be dead. And so by the 17th, he sends word that they can go and attach the cattle, they leave McCloskey behind, the same McCloskey who'll be killed somehow on the Blackwater draw. And uh, they uh, they say, we're not going to put up any resistance. McCloskey will count the cattle to make sure we have an accurate count because we expect to get him back. And then Tunstall and his party take off with nine horses. Six that are Tunstall's, two that are Brewers, and one that was either Billy Bonney's or Jesse Evans. So if, if it was either one of those two guys' horses, you're relatively sure it's stolen. And they're heading back to Lincoln. Because the posse said the, when they showed up the first time, we're here for the cattle. They didn't say we're here for your horses. And I'm sure at that point, Tunstall's thinking, hey, I just got to get whatever I can out of here, go back to Lincoln, and then wait for the spring term of court to convene. He probably can get more money from, you know, uh, from his father. He probably can weather the storm. And likely, if it was not a partisan court, 
if you got a judge with you know any modicum of fairness, the judge would say, wait a minute, you got a ten thousand dollar writ of attachment, you got fifty grand worth of property, or I mean, who knows how much they would have had by April? They might have taken tons of clothes. Could you imagine? <laughs> He's walking around in a towel because <laughs> he doesn't have any clothes left. <laughs> Oh my God. Anyway, so, you know, you, you got to imagine if, if they can hold out until the spring term of district court, they're going to win. I mean, McSween's going to pay the 10 grand back or he's going to lose 10 grand worth of stuff. Tunstall is going to have an attorney represent him and say, hey, we're not partners. He can't have McSween represent him in his own action, I don't believe. So he's got to get another attorney. But hey, th these guys are not partners. There's no agreement. So you took all this guy's stuff, Tunstall's stuff, unlawfully release it immediately. If you if you don't have enough of McSween's property to satisfy the writ and he doesn't pay it, you you can do something else. But you can't keep Tunstall's property just because you want it. So that's, I think that's the mindset Tunstall is in. I've got to ride this out. I'm outgunned. I am outmanned. I am, you know, just kind of outnumbered even by, you know, people, uh, you know, allies in Lincoln because Dolan and Murphy have been there and Brady for a long, long time. And so the court of popular opinion probably is not going to swing my way. I better just lay low, probably move into a room in the back of McSween's house and stare wistfully at his store as he's there wrapped in his little washcloth and, uh, and wait, wait for spring. Those nine horses, though, are the things that got John Henry Tunstall killed and started the violent phase of the Lincoln County War. The Lincoln, make no mistake, the war had already started well before that. The war started when, you know, uh, Tunstall showed up in town and built a store and then established a ranch and stated his intent to get the beef contracts for the Indian agency at Fort Stanton. Like, he basically said, I'm coming here to take all the business that you guys have. That's a declaration of war. Now, it's financial war at that point. But that's still a declaration of war. It's it's like somebody coming to your house and going, hey, you know what? It's a really nice place. I'm moving in here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat your food. I'm going to sleep in your bed. I'm going to shower in your shower. Yeah, I, I like this place. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what you do. Well, uh, of course you <laughs> try to throw them out. Well, that's what Murphy and Dolan did. And it didn't help that Murphy and Dolan were not in a good way financially. Again, I'd refer you back to the Drew Gomber episode where Drew talked about the fact that Murphy and Dolan were, I mean, they, they had some ridiculous interest rates, probably would be charged with usury today, and they were selling, uh, you know, wor not worthless, but <laughs> close to worthless land and ranches to uh, ranchers at ridiculously high prices, holding a note over their head, foreclosing, starting again. But they were just too nice to their friends, and they had a lot of friends, and they were struggling. So the timing for Tunstall probably seemed great. I get in there. Those, that lot is struggling financially. Who knows how long they'll last? I've got money. I've got financing for my father in England. And they don't. They'll go away. They'll slink out of town in the dark of night, go somewhere else. Filthy Irishman. But I don't think he counted on the response being... Uh, as overwhelming and as violent, ultimately, as it became. And he did write to his parents and talked about the fact that he has gone to carrying a gun and he didn't think he would need to use it. And it uh, it uh, fired a, a, a fearsome ball, I think was the term he used. But uh, he badly underestimated. If you say Billy the Kid, if you believe he died in Fort Sumner on July 14th, 1881, you can say, and I agree, that he badly underestimated Pat Garrett. Really badly. Thinking that Garrett wouldn't try to get him there, wouldn't come, to, you know, would wait until who knows what, for whatever. Um, that was a really poor uh, estimation of what Garrett would do. 
and it cost Billy his life. If you, if that's, if you're in that camp, you believe that. Well, Tunstall made a horrifically bad estimation of what Murphy and Dolan would do. And Susan McSween had no such illusions of uh, peace and tranquility. She told McSween, don't go into business with Tunstall and Tunstall, you shouldn't either for as sure as you do, they're going to kill you. Meaning Murphy and Dolan. And of course, that's exactly what happened to both Tunstall and McSween. The Lincoln County War and their association with each other cost both of them their lives in rather violent fashion. So they uh, leave early in the morning on February 18th, the fateful day. We'll talk more about that day. And they've got these nine horses. Fred Waits driving a buckboard, a wagon with a team, uh, two horses, Bobby and Jake. <laughs> I don't know that that was their names, but I was at a place in Netcong, New Jersey. When I was a kid, it was called Wild West City. And it actually was very cool. I mean, for, for a, I don't know, eight or nine year old kid, um, it was all Wild West buildings and, you know, sarsaparilla and, you know, gunfight shows and, and they had a, a stagecoach and they'd take you for a ride. And my cousin and I got to, uh, got to uh, sit up front and the, uh, the guy driving the coach had two horses and he'd slap them with the reins. Come on, Bobby Jake. Come on. Never forgot that. So Bobby and Jake were pulling the buckboard with Fred Waite. At least they are in my book, <laughs> Four Empty Graves. Uh, and by the way, this stagecoach at Wild West City got held up. Like, you know, bad guys would ride up and draw their guns. And uh, I remember one kid had a, he had bought a little, or his parents had bought him a little rifle with these plastic bullets. And I just coveted that thing. I was like, oh, just give me, because the kid wouldn't do anything. I would, I say, give me, I'll, I'll shoot him. You know, I'll save the stagecoach here with these little plastic, nothing bullets. But the kid just sat there frozen. So we got robbed. <laughs> anyway, so Fred waits on the buckboard. So he can't continue. Uh, he's got to take the main road to Lincoln. He can't go, you know, over the mountain pass, um, those kind of things. So he can't stay with the group. Would that have made any difference if Fred Waite uh, had been able to, you know, one more gun? Probably not. Probably not. But maybe Tunstall would have been in the wagon. I mean, if you remember the Young Guns 1 scene where old man <laughs> old man Tunstall is killed, he's left in his little buggy uh, by himself with uh, one or two horses pulling him. And, you know, he sees Billy and they have this meaningful look between them. And then the guns ring out and Tunstall's arms fly up and he falls at, you know, dead out of the wagon. And I mean, it didn't happen like that. But, but maybe if Fred Waite, had kept Tunstall in the wagon. They'd ridden together, and the you know the wagon was protected by the rest of those uh, regulators. Maybe it wouldn't have happened this way. I don't know that they went to kill Tunstall, but I don't think anybody in that posse really cared if they did or not. I mean, they weren't against it, is what I mean. That may not have been their stated purpose, because they did go to get those horses, but I think they were just looking for anything, anything, you know, shoot me a dirty look and we'll kill you. Yeah, you know, lift your pinky the wrong way while you're drinking your uh, proper cup of Earl Grey tea and we'll kill you. And Tunstall probably gave them more than a raised pinky as he sipped his afternoon tea, which we'll talk about after this. So we're... February 18th, late afternoon in uh, New Mexico, February the 18th, which is just a week from now. It's going to get dark um, 5.15, 5.20, 5.30 at the latest, absolute latest 5.30. But Tunstall and his men are, you know, coming down uh, a gorge toward the Rudoso River. And so they're in the mountains. And so it's a very good chance that it's already 
you know, dusk to them because the sun is low enough that it's behind the mountains. Tunstall's got himself, Middleton, Bonnie, Brewer, Widman, and uh, Middleton, John Middleton and Bonnie uh, are back near Tunstall, and uh, Brewer and Widman are scaring up a bunch of wild turkeys, and they try to go get some. And there's no, hey, boys, we'll be boys. Go ahead, boys. Tunstall's on the trail with the horses. Tunstall, it, it doesn't sound like a formidable war party. If you believed, well, they're going to go to the ranch, they're going to get the cattle, everybody's going to be happy and high five, and they'll leave us alone. That's a really, again, another significant underestimation of what Brady and Dolan would be willing to do. And uh, when after counting the uh, after counting the cattle, um, let's see who was it that was uh, Billy Morton is deputized and he's got fourteen men with him. So you got a party of fourteen or fifteen versus five. the The fatal mistake for Tunstall was he sent too many of his men on ahead. And he sent too many of his men in a different route. Henry Brown was with them, but uh, but turned off early toward Lincoln and, of course, Fred Waite. And 15 on 5 in mountainous territory where your enemy can get the high ground, it's just shooting fish in a barrel. So these nine horse Jesse Evans is with the, with the sub-posse of 15 members. And uh, they come up behind the Tunstall party. The sun is down, it's dusk, but it's light enough for them to tell. I imagine they can see two riders way up front, that's Brewer and Widman. And then I imagine they see two other riders lagging near the back, probably behind Tunstall at that, definitely behind Tunstall at that point, Bonnie and John Middleton. And of course, you see somebody sitting in the middle of the road with nine horses. And the posse probably thought, wow, look at this. It's like somebody served us up an hors d'oeuvre. All we've got to do is just go take him. And their stated intent is to attach the nine horses. Horses worth about 100 bucks a piece on average. That's what they would value them in a court case if somebody stole horses. 900 bucks worth of horses, $5,000 worth of cattle, $40,000 worth of inventory. I mean, where does it end? And Tunstall threw up his hands, not not literally, but threw up his hands and said, go ahead and take the cattle. I mean, I think he felt, I've done all I need to do. What more can they take from me? Well, what they could take was his life. And that's actually what they did. So the posse sees them. They start riding quickly toward them. And Billy is, uh, you know, riding up for Brewer and Widman. Middleton heads to Tunstall to, you know, get him off the trail and get to a defensive position. Again, if you can get the high ground, the horses are gone at this point. I mean, they're still there, but you, you got to realize now we're in a fight for our lives. Forget the damn horses. 900 bucks we can recover somehow. If you can get to the higher ground, you can get behind the rocks, you've got Winchesters, you could hold off a pretty significant group of men. Now, if these guys are battle trained and you're fighting five on 15 and they and they can you know work together and communicate and flank you, well, it, yeah, I mean, it's it would be tough to hold them off forever, but it's getting dark. They didn't have to hold them off. The regulators would not have had to hold them off for very long just until it got dark enough that nobody could fight anymore. And then they would probably make their way, you know, up the hill and find, you know, a safe spot to reconvene and figure their next move. Middleton is, you know, yelling for Tunstall to follow him. They need to get high enough up the hill that there's cover. There's, there's not, and if you look at pictures of, uh, you know, the Lincoln area, you'll, you'll, in those days, you'll see there's no trees. 
it's not like today where the mountains are, you know, just covered with trees because all those trees were cut down for firewood or for buildings or those kind of things. There's just nothing. And that would be very similar to, um, you know, a lot of areas in and around Lincoln County or really throughout the whole West at that time. There weren't, and there wasn't any conservation management, cut the damn trees down. We need wood. We need to build a fire. We need to build a house. We need to build something. So uh, a lot of these uh, slopes are not very um, well protected. It's not like you'd lose yourself in those trees. You'd have to get high enough to where some of the, you know, the smaller brushy timber would be or some rocks. And that's what the regulators are trying to do. And Middleton is yelling for Tunstall to follow him. And Tunstall, you know, in those last moments says, what, John? What, John? In other words, what, what are you saying? I, I don't get you. He's in a moment of panic. About 100 yards off the trail, the posse, or at least uh, Billy Morton, Jesse Evans, and Tom Hill, chased Tunstall off the trail about 100 yards. 100 yards is a pretty significant, it's a football field off the trail. And you think about that, did, did Tunstall make a run for it? In other words, was he trying to get away on his own? Was he thinking he could, was he thinking the regulators were back that way? I mean, he clearly kind of lost control of his faculties. And just put yourself in the mindset. You see this, this gaggle of gunmen coming. You know that your life has been threatened more than once. You, you've got a pretty good idea when they start shooting that they're not just there to get the horses and ride off and buy you an ice cream cone. And so there's got to be some panic that sets in. And it has to affect your ability to be rational. So as I was uh, thinking about this episode, I, th I thought, you know, you got three guys that are well armed, they're probably pointing weapons at you. And I'm thinking to myself, gosh, yeah, what would I have done? I've never been in that position. And then it occurred to me, yeah, actually, I have, I have been in that position. So uh, about 13, 14 years ago, I, uh, uh, I went to pick my daughter up to take her to school. I'd been divorced and was, uh, you know, I had, I, I lived a couple blocks away and I was going to pick my daughter up to take her to school. I had gone to the gym in the morning. And so I got there about 7am and I was about 10 or 15 minutes early. So I was sitting there just checking my phone and the uh, the block where where uh, you know my my ex lived was which was you know the house I used to live in had only houses on one side, and then the other side was the backyard wall or fence of all the other houses. So there was only really houses on one side, and so from that standpoint, there was not a lot of people or really anybody that ever parked on the street because there weren't that many houses and everybody had driveways. But I'm sitting there with the with the my little SUV running, and just out of the corner of my eye, I see this car coming down the other way, very very slowly. And I can remember it. It's a it's a, a maroon Mitsubishi, kind of beat up. The windows are all tinted and blacked out, and it pulls down. And it, it, it there's a, a a moment in my mind where I said, "Well, this is kind of odd. Like, what would somebody be doing here?" This is just not, it's not really a thoroughfare. You can't go anywhere from there. It's just inside the neighborhood. But I don't pay it any mind. It's, it, it can only be 15 or 20 seconds, 30 seconds at the outside later that my, uh, my vision goes to my rear view mirror. I'm pointing north. This car is on the other side of the street pointing south. And I see a, a young man get out. He's got a gray sweatshirt, like a zip up hoodie, and he zips it up and he pulls the hood down uh, over his head. And this is summertime, by the way, or you know, late spring. And I just remember the eyes. His eyes looked, looked scary. 
just dark and penetrating and he wasn't looking at me and he opens the back door i could see there's somebody in there and he reaches in and he pulls out a rifle and it was so surreal to me it was like uh you know watching something on tv like i i, I for for a, a second i thought what is going on here i couldn't make the connection that this was really happening and i was you know watching it uh, but he pulls this rifle out pulls the hood down further over his head and starts walking towards the house where my daughter is about to come out uh, he gets halfway in the street halfway across the street and he must at that point notice that there's somebody in my car meaning me and so he turns toward me and now the rifle is pointed at me at the back of my head and he's I don't know, 40 feet away, 30 feet away, maybe. And I remember distinctly in that moment, like I'm now I'm putting myself in the mind of Tunstall, like so many things run through your head. But the thing I thought is, shit, I'm going to be dead. And I'm not even going to be able to warn my daughter. And, and my, my very young son is in there too, who's going to be he's going to be 18 in uh, uh, next week. And I thought, what the hell do I do? I was not armed. This is before I was a gun owner. Um, I became one pretty quickly afterwards. Uh, and I, the only thing I could think to do was not get shot in the head. Like I, I knew I wouldn't be any good to anybody. So, uh, the car was running. I, I quickly, we're just, this house is just one house from the end of the block, right? You could turn to the right. And so I grabbed the gear shift, uh, the, you know, and I put it in drive and I nail it because what I want to do is I want to swing around and I want to use my car. I'm, I'm frantically trying to dial my X, like hitting the button. And I guess I got through as I turn the corner and then, you know, swing as quick a U-turn as I can. But all she, all she heard, I guess it was, it was gun, gun, gun. Didn't understand what I was saying. And then I'm, uh, you know, as, again, this is all in the space of very short, you know, probably 15 seconds, 20 seconds. Um, then I'm trying to call 911 as I come around the corner. And now I'm thinking, okay, by this point, the guy's at the front door. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to floor this thing and I'm going to drive across the front yard. We don't really have lawns for the most part in New Mexico. And I'm going to, I'm going to drive right into him and I'll crush him against the side of the house, right? That's my weapon. And if he gets a shot off and kills me, I'm probably still going to get him. But somewhere along the line between probably hearing me, you know, screeching the tires, the guy thinks the better of it, I guess and throws the rifle in the back of the car, jumps back in and takes off very fast. And I chase him through this little residential neighborhood where the speed limit 25 miles an hour and we're doing 65, 70, I'm chasing him. And I'm just waiting for the opportunity to get close enough because I'm just gonna run into the car. I mean, try to try to kill them, roll the car over, run them over, whatever, any, anything. I've got 911 on the phone, the emergency dispatcher. And I remember she said, she was very calm, almost kind of condescending. She said, you need to go home, sir. And I said, why? She, you need to go home and meet the officer because the guy you're chasing has a gun and you don't. <laughs> and it was such good advice. But at the time I was so infuriated and I just could not catch the guy. I mean, he was willing to, he was you know willing to kill somebody or maybe die. I mean, he was driving so fast. And so eventually, with my heart pounding out of my chest, I turned around, went back to the house and met the officer there. Okay. So John Henry Tunstall has got guns pointed at him. He's ridden 100 yards off the trail. And I wonder if he thinks he can talk these guys out of it. He, he thought he could win over Jesse Evans, you know, months before when Evans was in jail. I wonder if he thinks, hey, you know what? 
these ruffians, you know, can no match for my British wit. <laughs> Doing a Benny Hill sketch or something. But I don't think so. I think he had lost his, his, uh, uh, what's the word? His equilibrium when he couldn't, he couldn't understand what Middleton was telling him to do. Like, I think he had completely turned himself around mentally where he didn't know what to do, didn't know what was going to happen. And he just reacted instinctively. The, the three men of the posse said that Tunstall went for his gun and shot at them and they had no choice but to shoot him in self-defense. But, you know, clearly the forensics at the scene painted a different picture. He also killed his horse. But I would imagine, and I put myself in that position, if I'd had a gun, in my glove compartment or under the seat or wherever it might work, you know, in my belt, I probably would have not driven away and turned around I probably would have, you know, gotten out and taken my chances. I probably would have pulled the trigger, even though I knew there were other people in the car. There was at least one other person in the back, which probably means somebody was in the front. But I, I, I would have said, hey, you know what? I, it's, it's hell for leather here. I might as well take somebody with me if I'm going. And I, had, that, had I had a gun, I might not be here. Or they might not be here. And so Tunstall certainly had a gun on him. And I do believe that at that point, he determined he was going to die. And if he was going down, he might as well take somebody with him. So I do think he probably either shot at the posse. <laughs> it's hard. The posse has an air of legitimacy. They were just a gang. Uh, or... He raised his gun to do so, and they killed him first. I just can't imagine him sitting there trying to talk his way out of three guys that have already shown they're you know they're in that area to kill. They shot at his men unprovoked, and so a couple shots ring out. The uh, the, the story is up on the hillside. Bonnie says they've killed Tunstall. I mean, did he, did he say that? I mean, do we really know? We don't know. And how do you know they killed Tunstall? Maybe Tunstall killed one of them. But they, Tunstall was killed. And the posse has now got the horses and night is settling in and i don't think they want to test the remaining regulators especially after they just murdered their boss and so they ride on out and john henry tunstall is dead that was the point of no return uh in the lincoln county war that was it they killed you know, the leader of one of the two factions. It would be as if Billy Bonney and Fred Waite went over to Jimmy Dolan's house and shot him in the head and then, uh, you know, laughed as they walked down the street to Cullum's Eatery and had a plate of oysters. I mean, that it was a declaration of war and that that would have been the same thing. So there was no going back. I mean, at that point, what are you going to, what are you going to do if you're McSween and say, oh, well, let's, let's handle this in the courts now. Of course not. Even McSween, who was a man who apparently did not carry a gun. And uh, I think the original thinking is Ms. McSween, you know, had an aversion to violence. I don't think he did. I think he had an aversion to himself being involved in violence, but he didn't seem to mind other men doing that. I'm getting a message that I can record for 30 minutes max, but I'm only at 20 minutes in this segment. So Tunstall's dead. The war has started. And within days, Morton Baker and McCloskey will be killed in the Blackwater draw. And then somehow, some way, <laughs> the regulators are going to get the bright idea to kill Sheriff Brady. 
And if you want to talk about miscalculations, Billy's miscalculation in thinking that uh, Garrett wouldn't come for him, Tunstall's miscalculation thinking that, you know, he could talk and litigate his way out of things. Uh, well, the killing of Brady was a significant miscalculation. It cost Billy his life ultimately, again, if that's what you believe. Um, and while th there's certainly no love lost for Sheriff Brady among Billy the Kid fans, um, that turned the tide against the tide of public opinion against the regulators and allowed Dolan's forces to swell and allowed him to influence, uh, you know, the army to, uh, to come in Colonel Dudley and, and put down this insurrection, this uprising because they'd killed a, you know, a legitimate lawman, but that's a story for another day. Now, here's one thing I didn't tell you about the uh, the gun incident with me. Uh, I I can't for sure say that this guy I, he looked like he was on drugs. I mean, that's the that's the intent, or that I mean, that's the vision I got. I mean, his eyes were just wild. He looked like not in control. But in any event, uh, right next door to that house lived my neighbors. I'm not going to say their name, and their son. Uh, well, they had two sons. Uh, their son was a, uh, is a, and was, is, I don't even know, uh, kind of a world famous poker player, you know, world poker tour. The other son uh, had been uh, in jail for some, I, for, I don't even know what, but was also a, a poker player and, you know, and, and got into some, got sideways with the law and wound up going to jail. I don't know that these guys or girls or whoever in the car, didn't think, hey, maybe somebody's here with a stack of cash. Let's break in there. They could have been going next door. It literally was almost a shared driveway. Like their driveway was right next to the driveway of my house. So it could have been going to either house. But as I said, my daughter would have been opening the garage any second, any second, and walking out there. And this guy would be standing there. So I never got straight on that but I certainly got straight on the fact that I was not going to be caught unaware again. And I have not. So next week, depending upon when you're listening to this, will be February the 18th and will mark the 144th anniversary of the death of young John Tunstall and the kickoff of the Lincoln County War. Think about what I said, though. If one decision, one tiny decision had been made differently, think about the ramifications of that. In other words, let's assume that rather than leaving the ranch with nine horses, Bonnie, Middleton, Widman, and Brewer, Tunstall stays. He sends McCloskey out because McCloskey knows the posse members. They go, hey, come on in. We're cooking breakfast. Tunstall's going to turn the cattle over. They're not, they're not McSween's, but he's going to turn them over to you. You take the horses too. Take whatever you want. They're going to wait until the spring term of court to sort this out. If that had happened, there's no Lincoln County war. If there's no Lincoln County War, there's probably no Billy the Kid. Because you'll remember Billy's stated intention is, hey, you know, I, I, I kind of want to go straight. You know, everybody else got to walk away because they were not indicted and they took the uh, pleaded the governor's general amnesty. But I was the one indicted for the murder of Brady and I can't I can't get amnesty. And so I, I, I got to keep I got to keep running. I've got enemies. Now I've got the law on me. And that, you know, ultimate continued outlawry, steer, stealing horses and cattle, you know, is what makes Billy, uh, you know, at least in the papers, maybe public enemy number one or, you know, in the, in the top five anyway. And then Garrett gets elected and captures him and sends him to trial and he's sentenced to hang and he kills Brady. And, you know, I'm uh, Bell and Ollinger, like all, all those things, none of those things happen. 
If there's no Lincoln County war, Brady never gets killed. There's no indictment against Billy. He's got, uh, uh, he's got uh, a, a, a ranch with uh, Fred Waite. They have plans to go into ranching together. I mean, th those guys probably become like the co-cousins, right? They, they do some farming. They do a little ranching. Eh, they steal a cow every now and again. They go into town. They have a drink. They get married. They have kids. You never know who Billy Bonnie is. Never. But of course, we do know who he is because of the Lincoln County War. Imagine there was no Lincoln County War. Imagine the history of New Mexico. Yeah, and during the late 1880s, nothing much happened. It was pretty calm. Move on. You know, they just skipped to 1945 when, you know, they tested the, uh, you know, the Trinity site. They tested the first atomic bomb. Yeah, nothing happened between, you know, 1870 and 1945. It was a pretty boring place, actually. Just one decision, one tiny thing, creates that butterfly ripple effect across history and across time. There's no Young Guns movies, no Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, no epic series with Billy the Kid, no Back to Billy books by me, or uh, the hack author, as I've been called. <laughs> None of it. It all goes away. And history is something completely different than we know. But because of one decision by John Henry Tunstall, and he was not wrong, by the way. I'm not suggesting that. But because he says, I'll give him the cattle, I'm just going to take my horses and go back to Lincoln, just because of that, we have all of this history. And we're here 140 plus years later still talking about it. Crazy. If one of the posse, I think it was Buck Morton, but let me let me see if I can find it. Because I'd like to give you the actual. Uh, Billy Matthews, actually. Matthews is the one that deputizes Morton. And uh, if Matthews had said, oh, you know what, just let him go with the friggin' horses. We'll get him in Lincoln. They're going to Lincoln with the horses. We'll just meet him there. We got the cattle. Let's get some sleep. Right? If if he had just made that one decision and said, ah, you know what, we'll, we'll get him tomorrow. It's not a big deal. Where are they going to go? Tunstall doesn't get killed. There's no Lincoln County War. There's no Billy the Kid. And there's no All Things <laughs> Billy podcast. Crazy. It's crazy how these tiny, minute things all have to fall in place in order for these events to happen. So how does February 18th figure into the Back to Billy book series? Well, the final book in the series, and by the way, you know, I've been putting in the show notes, you know, the website where you can buy them. Well, you know, I, 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 I went pretty small time. I started selling books on Amazon on my own, and it's a fool's errand. It really is. Amazon just takes their pound of flesh. It's this many dollars a month just to sell, and then it's this much per book, and then it's the, and then they hold your money back. There's just no money in it for small time author or publishing company. But with this last book, I changed up and I, I used a company called Ingram Spark, and they are a book uh, printer and distributor. They're ali aligned with uh, all the big distributors, and so this book. Four Empty Graves is now, it'll be officially released on February the 18th. That's by design. But it's already available on Amazon, barnesandnoble.com, Apple Books. It's in a uh, uh, soft cover uh, paperback <laughs> and ebook format, the first of the Back to Billy series in ebook format. So you can go to any of those places. So I used to have to type in the links, but yeah, just search for Four Empty Graves in Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Apple Books, you know, basically anywhere you buy books because they're aligned with all the big distributors, you can get it or you can get the ebook too. You cannot get the ebook. Uh, you can't buy it today and read it today. Even if you buy it today, it's a pre-order and you still have to wait until the 18th and it'll be automatically uploaded to your device or downloaded, I guess, to your device. 
Um, so do that. But what's so special about February the 18th? Well, as I was writing this book, and this is the absolute, I swear this is the end. It's a six book trilogy. It, it's too, it's too much. <laughs> it's too much. But this book closes all of the loopholes. It tells the entire story. But the, the, the most dramatic and significant events all center around everyone. It's kind of like a whirlwind that sucks everybody in to Lincoln and to February the 18th, 1878, because of course, that's the start of the Lincoln County War. That's the start of what, what made Billy the Kid famous. That's, you know, the, the event that couldn't be changed. And so these people, Billy and the regulators and Martin Teebs, our time traveling friend and Steve from Capitan, they all got sucked into this because there's, there's an event that's going to happen that's going to dictate the rest of all of their lives. And it's going to happen on February the 18th. So I wanted to wait until February the 18th to release the book so that people that read it would understand how significant that day is. And I, I think that for those of you that have ordered it already, um, the pre-orders have gone out. So some people have actually received it. If you pre-ordered a paperback copy and got it, please send me a message or a picture or something. Um, let me know that you received it. But for the rest of you, it'll it'll be available in another uh, week. Uh, a week, I guess. And uh, and you'll you'll very quickly understand. I mean, very quickly. It's two hundred ninety pages, but when you get to the end, you'll understand why it had to be that day. It had to be February the 18th where everything took place. It absolutely had to be. Otherwise, the story couldn't be resolved. But it's resolved. It's over. It's over, Johnny. <laughs> Wasn't that Troutman and Rambo? It's over, Johnny. Nothing is over. You didn't know you were getting impressions on this show, did you? So four empty graves, and there's a clue in the title as well. I want to tell you about the artwork for the title. Um, for those of you that know me or, you know, or we're connected on social media, you probably have seen this already. But I commissioned a graphic artist to do the artwork, and what I wanted was the famous Fort Sumner grave to look as if it had been dug up. And when I got the initial image from the artist, I, I froze for a second. I thought, holy shit, that's a real picture. I mean, it looks like a photograph. And if you look, the cage is gone. And the grave on the right where Billy would be is dug up, or at least there's piles of dirt on either side. And I thought, well, this is crazy, like crazy good and realistic. Now, it wasn't perfect. I needed something different for the book cover. But uh, what I uh, what I did is I sent it to a few people, unsolicited and unannounced. In other words, I didn't tell them what I was sending, or what it was. And some people that are in the know as it relates to the world of Billy the Kid had that exact same reaction. Holy shit, what happened? When did this happen? When is this picture from? And then it got posted or reposted in some of the Billy the Kid groups that I'm not in, probably because I've been thrown out. <laughs> I, I I don't take it. I don't relish that. I mean, I... Yeah, I, I probably, you know, questioned too many things at some point. So they tossed me out. But anyway, um, and, and so now people are losing their minds about this picture of the grave exhumed. Who did it? Who ripped the cage off? What the hell is going on? So it was uh, quite an interesting experience. I sent it back to the artist and said, hey, this is great, but I actually need a coffin like as if somebody actually pulled the box out of the ground and then put a shovel in the dirt and then make it at sunset. And for anyone who's read the books, especially the third book in the trilogy, Sunset and Sumner, you'd know why that's so important. 
Um, and so the, the cover of the book to me is, I mean, it's just eerily beautiful. It's this, uh, you know, kind of pale, not pale, I guess, vibrant reddish orange sunset of the actual grave in Fort Sumner, except the cage is gone and there's the coffin and there's the shovel and somebody's dug it up. And the name of the book would have been five empty graves, but there's a, an X through the five as if somebody thought the better of it and called it four empty graves. And again, there's a clue in that title as to the ending of the book. So maybe you'll figure it out before you read it. Maybe you'll figure it out and never read it, or maybe you'll read it and never figure Well, you'll, you'll figure it out if you read the book, at least by the end. So February the 18th, the date that changed the history of New Mexico forever. I mean, gave us, you know, one of the most significant uh, occurrences of the old West and gave us the most enduring character, you know, and legend of the old West in William H. Bonney, Billy the Kid. February the 18th, 2022, gives you a book that will change the history of Lincoln County and Billy the Kid, Martin Teebs, and Rosita Luna, and everybody involved once and for all. And <laughs> the story will come to an end. So I hope you have uh, enjoyed our retrospective of the ending of John Henry Tunstall. And uh, please uh, email, Twitter, tw Twitter the show, <laughs> Twitter that show, tweet the show anytime if you've got some ideas for content, working on some new interviews. Uh, got to, we'll have a great show coming up next week with Kelly Kidd, or as I like to call him, Kelly Childs. That's his... Uh, pseudonym because I wrote him as a character into the last book in my series. But uh, Kelly is a Pat Garrett historian, uh, reenactor, and he is an actor and he's played Pat Garrett in two films. And actually, both of those films are mine. So we're going to talk to Kelly about getting into character, about the real Pat Garrett historically, uh, you know, and what he uh, what he thinks about him. Um, but we're also uh, going to talk to him about, you know, what it's like to portray a legend like that on film and what kind of preparation you need to, uh, to get through. And does it bother you when your lines take you away from what you know or believe to be true? So we'll have that show for you next week, working on some other uh, really exciting interviews, but I don't want to mention anything and uh, you jinx myself just yet. But uh, until then, I am your host without a bullet in me, Michael Anthony Judicici. This is All Things Billy, and you are done. Have a great day. Thanks for joining me.